Welcome to the Andy Staples Show. Got a special edition today. We are talking about another podcast at The Athletic, and I'm hoping you've already found it. If you haven't, I'm warning you now, you're going to be binging because I have been binging all morning. I'm recording with our Indianapolis Colts beat writer, Zach Kiefer, on a Monday. The podcast that he's been working on dropped this morning. It's a six-parter. I have been binging since I woke up. I am through episode four. Guys, you got to listen to this thing. It is all about Andrew Luck. And, you know, we college football folks know him as the Stanford great. Obviously, we all saw him in the NFL. He retired at age 29. He remains one of the most interesting figures in the sport because you kind of wonder what would have happened had he kept playing. Zach, you, you just wrapped this thing. You just launched this six-part series. Have you have you gotten any sleep yet? Running on fumes. Uh, I was asked earlier today by someone about the Colts' current team, and I was like, "Wait, Matt Ryan's the quarterback, right?" Like it's, it's not, I've, not I've Philip Rivers. Living, <laughs> yeah, I was like, I've been living in the past. I've been living Andrew Luck for the for the last couple of weeks as we try to finish this. We did so many interviews and we had so much audio, but it, it was fascinating. I mean, I, I I thought I knew the Andrew Luck story. I really did. I covered all of it in the NFL. And I was wrong. I, I just didn't I didn't know all of it. These scenes that these people told me about, the stuff behind the scenes, it, it just pulled back the curtain in a way I'd never heard it. And and it left me with this thought. I, I think it's one of the most fascinating stories the NFL's ever seen. In the last 20 years at least. I mean, it's messy and it's complicated and it's it's unfinished in a lot of ways. Yeah, and I think that's the part that people can't wrap their brains around because there are only so many of these kinds of quarterbacks. And, and you get into this really thoroughly, really in episode two, where you talk about what kind of draft prospect he is. And, and you, you talk to Jer Daniel Jeremiah about watching his pro day and and to Bill Polian, who was the Colts GM until he got fired that January. And and then all the other people who were involved in the decision making process. And then he comes in and, and is all of what he was supposed to be. But now he's gone. And this is. This is such a limited resource in the sport. The the Patrick Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers, guy who can take you to the playoffs every year kind of quarterback. It's wild. Daniel Jeremiah was the West Coast scout for the Eagles at this time. So he literally reads off Andrew Luck's scouting report coming out of Stanford. And it's remarkable. I mean, we've all heard these great scouting reports for these top tier prospects. And he says Luck's floor was as close to his ceiling as any player he's ever scouted he said Amazing. at worst at worst he was a multi-year pro bowler that's if he was a bust and at best he was a hall of famer and that's what he would have been if he would have stayed healthy and all that and, and we get into that later in the series but it was really revealing to get into it with david shaw and, and to yeah. meet a pritchard who was the quarterback there who thought he was going to be the quarterback the whole time and then this kid out of houston who you know andrew luck wasn't that highly recruited and I didn't know the whole story getting to Stanford and taking over and I mean Harbaugh Harbaugh recruited him but Harbaugh was recruiting over him Andrew Luck signed he's recruiting Robert he Griffin going, over him he's going after yeah. RG3 and yeah. imagine that quarterback room if they had both landed there imagine how that would have changed college football if those guys were both on the same team who, who ends up transferring where do they go do they go in the draft the same year I didn't know any of that stuff and yeah. that was really fascinating well and the Texas fans uh, continually lament that Andrew Luck was not very heavily recruited by them. That How did they not recruit him? He his college his high school tape was insane. Yeah, at Texas A&M right down the road, like he, he could have been there. LSU's not far from Houston, like it I there were a lot of LSU, powers. Right, right. Yeah. It, it doesn't make sense. His list was Rice and Purdue and Oklahoma State and Stanford. Like, really? The Oklahoma State makes sense because Mike Gundy always has an eye. He, he's always been good at at seeing something maybe that, that others don't. But the Harbaugh thing was interesting because that was kind of right when Harbaugh got there. You know, he'd been at San Diego, which was FCS non-scholarship football. It was a completely different level. He was moving up. And so it, it doesn't surprise me that he was trying to find undervalued assets at the quarterback position. But... The luck thing's interesting. And, and that first episode, you talk about his upbringing. And for those who don't know, uh, Andrew Luck's father, Oliver, who was the former West Virginia athletic director, he was a vice president of the NCAA for a while. But for, for most of Andrew's childhood, he was the president of NFL Europe. 
And so Andrew grew up in Europe for a lot of his childhood. And I, I love how, how you kind of pepper this through the, the series, like how different that made him. To this day, he's different. And I think it all goes back to that. I mean, seven years in Germany, three in London, you know, he, he found football on this VHS tape of his dad playing for the Oilers in 1985. And, and he watched it a thousand times. His first game he ever watched live was that John Elway, Brett Favre Super Bowl. <clears throat> wow. And he had to stay up and watch it at, you know, three in the morning or whatever it was. But, you know, he had to teach his, his, his classmates in London how to play. Like he had to teach him the rules of the game because nobody knew how to play football. And this didn't even make the cut, but when Oliver and Andrew would go throw the ball in the, in the backyard, they would draw stares from neighbors because throwing a football was yeah, so What are you forward. doing? What is that? What, what is that weird rugby ball? Right. And, and he's a huge soccer fan to this day, huge soccer fan. And obviously that started over there as well, but not a normal childhood, not a normal football start. And, and so he came, you know, he came to Houston and he was this big quarterback for this big school in Houston. And then obviously at Stanford, but all of that, all of his personality ran counter to what we'd expect from that stereotypical college and high school star. I, I just remember meeting him for the first time. It was 2010 and the PAC 12 was doing, or I guess it was the PAC 10 at the time. They were doing a New York media day. I was working for sports illustrated and I live in Florida, but I had gone up to the office because there, there were some things going on in that part of the summer with various different leagues. And one of them was this PAC 12, you know, East coast media day. And so they had a, a dinner at a Mexican restaurant and had some of the players that they brought just kind of sit with us and talk. And so I ended up at a table with Andrew Luck and Nick Foles, who both fascinating guys. So like Nick Foles' dad is like a big time restaurateur from Austin. So they had a lot to talk. They, they you know, they knew each other already from the, the circuit. But Luck was just amazing to me because I was at the time in my early 30s. And I remember thinking, this guy is so much more mature than I am. And maybe then I'll ever be. Uh, it it felt 100%. like I was talking to my dad. He's he's so different than every athlete I've ever covered. And one of the coolest things about an NFL locker room is that every player has a different story, right? Everybody comes from somewhere. And no two players make the league the same. But Andrew was this celebrity quarterback who was averse to attention. Like he he read books on concrete. He could talk about any country in the world. He had a Velcro wallet with his college logo on it. He was a millionaire and he had a flip phone. He really did have a flip phone for years and his teammates would get pissed off because they'd send him photos and he couldn't open them. Like you're a millionaire, dude. Like he, he wore these boxy Joseph A. Banks suits to his interviews his first couple of years because he just didn't care about like getting a fancy suit or getting it fitted or anything like that. So he just was, there's just no one like him in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, and that made him a really fun guy to cover and a really fascinating character on the football field. Well, too. You, you could tell him as juicy had in that, that dinner because he's making fun of Jim Harbaugh and talking about how oh, much he makes fun of Jim Harbaugh. Like it, I, I had written a column earlier that Sunday. This was Twitter was very new, but Harbaugh was actually a fairly early adopter when he was the Stanford coach and would do fun stuff. Like if there was somebody he was recruiting – he kind of send coded messages to them because the NCAA wouldn't allow you to just directly tweet at them. And so I decoded them and, but de couldn't decode them all because I, sometimes I just didn't know what they meant. Like, like one was a, a, one was just lyrics from the record of the Edmund Fitzgerald, which I didn't know exactly what, what he Sounds was like talking about. Tweet. Well, Harbaugh, I, I did ask him about it later. And he's like, I just like the song. So, uh, but, but luck apparently had read it. And he said everybody passed it around the Stanford locker room and they were just laughing because it made they knew it made Harbaugh mad. And so I was like, man, this guy's this guy's got something to him. If he can if he can poke fun at that particular bear right now at this stage in his career. But but you get into that at Stanford where you talk about how much control he was given at the end of his career there. I mean, it, it was it was amazing. Yeah. And. And that's so fascinating because he's in this Heisman race with RG3. I mean, two of the best quarterbacks we've seen in college football in a long time, a long time. And I mean, they were both great in very different special ways. But, you know, RG3 has this great game one week. And so I asked David Shaw, like, how did Luck approach that? Like, me knowing Andrew the way I do, like, I would think he doesn't really care about the Heisman. Like, genuinely, like, it, it doesn't matter that much to him. And Shaw's like, no, he cared about it. But like the next week they go to that game and I think it was at Washington and, you know, they play the two high safeties. And so Luck just 
He can do anything he wants at the line. He's got complete control of the offense. Shaw just gave him the keys, and and he threw it like 20 times the whole night for 150 yards. They won 65-21 because they ran for 450 yards. And and afterwards, Shaw is like, I- I'm conflicted. The coach is like, I love this guy because he's so selfish, selfless, excuse me. But secondly, can't you be like a little selfish? Like, don't you want to pad your stats for this Heisman race? But Luck didn't care. He, he said, Coach, I just had my best game, like my best game. And it wasn't his best game in the stat sheets. So they just don't make him like that. They just don't make him like that very often. He he released a one sentence release when he when he decided to go back to Stanford. Would have been the first overall pick the year Cam Newton came out. Decided to come back to Stanford because he just didn't want to leave his teammates and, and liked college. Like, it was that simple to him. He didn't overcomplicate it. Um, kind of a breath of fresh air in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that game and that that result because I don't want to give away too much from down the road because I want everybody to listen to every episode. But in his pro career, it becomes a bone of contention that the Colts can't run the ball. He's not interested in his stats. He's interested in... Here's what you got to do to win. It's remarkable. You go back. His best season is 2014. He threw for 40 touchdowns, led the league in that category, was was really like right there. I mean, like another healthy year, he's an MVP. They didn't have a running back. Like like Trent Richardson fell apart. Right. Boom Heron. Boom Heron from Ohio State was the running back by default. He carried a team with no offensive line and Boom Heron to the AFC Championship game. Beat a good Bengals team and a good Broncos team in the playoffs and – you know, ask David Shaw, who's been a coach forever, played in the league. Like, did they do enough to protect this guy? And I won't give away the answer, but I will tell you this. David Shaw said that's the most loaded question I've ever been asked in my life. Wow. And then he and then and then he and then he answered. And then he gave me some yep. truth. Um, that was really fascinating. David Shaw was absolutely one of my favorite conversations. Doing this whole body transformation thing, getting in my daily workout is a must. But up until recently, if I had a few drinks the day before, it sometimes didn't happen. Now, though, I drink azebiotics before any alcohol, and I know tomorrow I'm going to be able to stick to my routine. We all have busy lives, and these days, it can't afford to waste a day stuck on the couch because of a few, few drinks the night before. Zbiotics is the answer we've all been looking for. Zbiotics pre alcohol probiotic is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break down this byproduct. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut where you need it the most. Just remember to drink Zbiotics before drinking alcohol, drink responsibly, and get a good night's sleep to feel your best tomorrow. The first time I tried it, I... I drank the Zbiotics. I was going to have a, a few old fashions and I, I know those can hit pretty hard, especially if I have them close to bedtime, but woke up fresh as a daisy, felt great. And now every time I know I'm going to have something, pop a Zbiotics, doing good. So give Zbiotics a try for yourself. Go to zbiotics.com slash Andy to get 15% off your first order when you use the code Andy at checkout. Zbiotics is back with a hundred percent money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, They'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash Andy and use the code Andy at checkout for 15% off. Thank you to Zbiotics for sponsoring this episode. Well, speaking of David Shaw, you had a, a really good conversation with him about Andrew Luck's thirst for contact. And we're going to play a little clip uh, about his early times as a starter and then about something that happened in the 2010 USC game that I know most of the people listening will remember as soon as they hear it. Getting hit. There were times where we would actually use Tavita Pritchard or Alex Lucas as our, our athletic quarterbacks to go in and run the ball just to take some hits off of them. And he would be so pissed, so pissed to take him off the field, to put somebody else out there to run the ball. Like He's like, you see me? Like I would love to do that. I want to do that. The signature hit of Luck's college career wasn't one he absorbed, but one he dished out. It came in his second season as the starter in 2010 against rival USC. Stanford was driving just before the half, and what ensued 
is something they're still talking about in Palo Alto, even a decade later. Out of the eye in a tight formation. We're at the end of the first half, and we're trying to hand the ball off to get to halftime. And Stephon Taylor, who never fumbles, I'm like, fumbles. Loose ball. Woo-hoo! USC has it, and Luck saved a touchdown by Creamy. Sharice Wright, are you kidding? When the ball went down on the ground, Andrew went from like the, the quarterback kind of posture and ball hit the ground and you see his body weight drop, right? His, his body weight drops, right? To be like a defensive player. Like, you know, you want to have angles for power, right? You want to bend at the knees, bend at your hips, bend at your ankles. And he dropped down and Sharice picked that ball up and Andrew was a missile. He turned his body into a projectile. That was the quarterback. That's the hardest quarterback shot I've ever seen. Zach, I remember where I was when I saw that hit and just going, oh, and, and it, I can't, I can't decide if it's that play or the, there was a, a trick play they ran where they wind up throwing to him along the sideline and he makes this diving one-handed catch. I, I can't remember if which one of those is my favorite or I can never decide which one of those is my favorite, but that's the level of athlete you're dealing with when you're talking about Andrew Luck and it just, but that that contact, that desire for contact, because right before that clip, you hear David Shaw talking about Andrew's first game as Stanford starter, where he lowered his right shoulder, his throwing shoulder, which every quarterback coach in America will tell you to protect. Lowered his right shoulder, dump trucked a defender to get an extra three or four yards, came off to the sideline after the series and goes, I know, look, I know you're mad at me about that, but I needed to get the first hit out of the way. There's this weird instinct in him. Like what made him great also made him reckless. I mean, those are the words yeah. he used later in his career in a conversation with me. But like he he was this privileged son of an NFL quarterback, this really smart kid who went to Stanford, but like all the while never thought he was better than anybody. He never thought he was more important than anybody on the field. He was, by the way. But it's almost like he needed to prove to – the team, the coaches, the fans, maybe himself, the media, that he was just another player and that he would take every hit. There's this great story from Bruce Arians in his first year with the Colts. Bruce Arians became the interim coach and they win nine of 12 and all that. Luck throws an interception and, and, and goes and makes the tackle on the defender. A little bit like the Sharice Wright play. It wasn't as highlight worthy, but he comes off to the sideline and Arians rips into him. Like, what are you doing? You're the quarterback. You don't make the tackle. And Luck said, no, no, no if I throw the interception, I make the tackle. It's like a responsibility to a rule. And like Arian said, role. the hell you do. You're our franchise. Well, you're the guy we moved on from Peyton Manning for, but it was, it, it took five or six years for him to get that out of his head. And what it cost him obviously comes down the line. Well, before we get into that part of it, because I do think what we saw in college with, with his desire for contact was very instructive about what the future was going to look like. And, and what happens in the NFL when you're a quarterback who, who desires contact. But you guys do a really good job laying out in, in episode two exactly how momentous it was for the, the torch passing to happen the way it did. Now, obviously, Peyton Manning didn't want it to happen that way. But you had the incredibly rare situation where you had a Hall of Famer leaving, who, by the way, would take another team to two Super Bowls. You had a Hall of Famer leaving, you're bringing in another guy, and nobody seems particularly upset about it. It's crazy. I mean, will we ever see this like again? No. Like I know the Ro- I know the Packers went from Favre to Rodgers, but that but that was really messy. And and this was messy to a degree, but like Robert Mays, our colleague, kind of explained really well. Like, and I you know I have to say, like I grew up in Indianapolis. Like it was it was momentous. Like you did you just didn't move on from Peyton Manning. It was unfathomable to a lot of people, regardless of what's happening next. But around the league, when you look at it, and Bob Kravitz, you know, wrote, he was the first one to write it. And, and, and Peyton was not happy. And he walked up to Bob in the locker room and said, hey, it's Andrew Luck's agent. And, you know, they make the decision and they know it's the right decision. It makes sense. Like, it just made sense. You, you don't move on from Peyton Manning unless there's another Peyton Manning waiting at the top of the draft. And, and they thought they had another Peyton Manning, and they did in a lot of respects. But. I mean, historic. Look at the 2013 draft. Like, who went number one that year? Eric Fisher. Like, yeah. there wasn't a quarterback in the top 15 picks. It just, 
it was this crazy symmetry of all these things colliding at the same time. And I don't know if we'll ever see that again, quite like that. Yeah. And then he gets into his career and he is as good as advertised. I mean, what, they were 11 and five his rookie year. They weren't even good. Like they weren't even good. Like they, they were supposed to be a rebuilding team that won five games. He was just special. Like he led seven fourth quarter comebacks as a rookie, as a rookie. And, and there's this great story from Bruce Arians early in his career. So luck doesn't, he's not even there for mini camp. He's not even there until like mid June. Like he's got to finish his degree at Stanford. Right. So he's not even there for the spring. He shows up the, the second day and just lights the defense up, lights him up, knows the offense somehow he's been studying. And the next day, Bruce Arians shows up in all black and he walks through the defensive huddle and they're all like, coach, what are you wearing black for? And Aaron's just like, I'm going to a funeral. And they're like, oh, man, <laughs> whose funeral? And he's like, y'all's. Andrew <laughs> killed you guys yesterday. I mean, that was Andrew Luck as a rookie, this goofy, brainy kid out of Stanford that just had this switch he could flip. And he just tore these guys up. And a very flawed roster with no offensive line and very little skill position talent. They just they won 33 games in three years because of number 12. And then the, the injuries start to mount. And... So, like I said, I, I'm on episode four. We would have talked about this after I finished, but again, it dropped this morning. So I've, I've listened to it You've made as, your much way as, I, as much as I can. But I, I honestly can't wait. I'm kind of hanging on the edge of my seat where I had to stop is after he's hit by Danny Trevathan. And this hit, when you discuss what happens later, sounds like just almost like a car crash. Like what happened to Andrew Luck on this one hit? Yeah. So the problem is he'd already played with torn ribs, right? He'd already played with busted ribs. He's getting pain killing shots. His shoulders already messed up. So he's already like fighting through a lot of stuff. And then the pocket collapses, which it often did. And they're playing the Broncos and they have to win this game. And he runs out of the pocket and he doesn't slide and he gets sandwiched. I mean, absolutely. It's a, it's a vicious hit, even for NFL standards. Like, it's vicious. You could hear it in the press box. Like, the stadium just stopped. Like, it was just silent. And we had seen these hits before. But, you know, Trevathan slams into his kidney. And, and, and Vance Walker, a huge defensive lineman, hits him from behind. So it's a two-way hit. And I talked to Andrew about this play uh, a couple months later. And, and he thinks the wind's knocked out of him. You know, his spleen is ruptured. Like, his kidney is torn open at this point. And abdomen muscles ripped open as well. And he can't even talk in the huddle. He's like, how am I going to talk? Finally, he spits out the play, throws a touchdown the next play. And everybody celebrates. Everybody in the stadium celebrates. They beat the Broncos. The Broncos won the Super Bowl this year. And Luck just walks off the field real slowly, can't even lift his arms, and says to himself, I can't wait to go sit down. And you'll hear in the podcast him in the press conference. Like, listen to this man's voice. It sounds like he's in hell. That, he that's the home. part. If, yeah, you, if, you, if you don't listen to anything else, like that – audio from that press conference like i was visibly gasping it's painful yeah hearing him try and or i guess audibly gasping hearing him try to talk like it was it was crazy because you, you hear that first sort of <gasps> it's just i mean talking it, is difficult speaking and then it's hard and then the fact that he didn't come off the field beat the best state beat the best defense in football that's 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 I mean, that day was a huge part of Andrew Luck's career. It spoke to so many different things. And he wakes up the next day and he's peeing blood. I mean, oh, God. Yeah. And, and then and, it's just the nightmare began. Well, and, and when he retired and I'm not I'm not giving away any episode six secrets. We all remember what happened. But when he retired, he talked about the cycle of pain, recovery, pain, recovery, pain, recovery, and he, he did, couldn't do that anymore. And that's the part because I think in our brains, again, I get back to this just being such a, a limited resource in the game of football, the, the quarterback who can, who can take you to a championship in the NFL that you think, well, but, but wouldn't, wouldn't you just stop for a while and, and get out of the cycle or what, but what, what happened as he tried to do that? That's where this just doesn't make sense. Like quarterbacks don't retire because of a calf injury, because of an ankle. Like just rehab it for a couple months, right? 
that's what we think. But this guy had been through hell and it started in 15. It started in 2015. And, and what made everything worse, every, this is the biggest mistake in all this was playing through the injury in 15 and 16, he torn labrum in his shoulder. And it just got so much worse. And, and that complicated the rehab in 17 and he tried to come back too early. And I mean, that's three and a half years and he was miserable. I mean, these are direct quotes from him. I was a miserable SOB to be around. Yeah. And there's a really telling moment from Andrew Luck's wife, Nicole, his fiance at the time. You know, he'd spent so much time with Tom House, the famed throwing guru. And at one point when he finally comes back, Andrew runs up to Tom House on the sidelines of the game and says, thank you for getting me my Andrew back. This was not just a football. Wow. This was not just a football thing for him. This was his life. His life was miserable. He was depressed. I mean, he was in a really dark place. And a lot of this has to do with mental health. I mean, he brought it to the forefront. And when he looked ahead, when he looked at that 2019 season and thought, I'm going to be in the training room four days a week. I'm not going to be the same player on the field. I'm probably going to hate myself again. He, he just didn't want anything to do with that. The shoulder was that hard. It changed his perspective on everything. And, um, he just said, no, he said, I'm out. Well, and, and, but the way that happened, unfortunately, there's nothing the Colts can do about this. If they don't, you, like, you don't get a compensatory pick because a once in a lifetime quarterback decides to retire at 29. Like 15 now you days have to, before the season, 15 yeah. days before the season opener. Yeah. So they, they have tried, you know, they've tried Jacoby Brissett, Carson Wentz, Philip Rivers, Matt Ryan will be finishing out his career there, kind of trying, I guess, trying to shepherd them to the next Peyton Manning or Andrew Luck, they hope, in the draft. But how has it been for them since, since all this happened? You know, I'll, I'll give them credit. They didn't crater. Like, a, a, lot, of t a lot of franchises would have just fallen apart. Um, they didn't crater. They've been competitive. They made the playoffs one year. You know, they would have made it last year if they didn't piss the down Jags. the leg in Jacksonville. Yeah. Right, 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 yeah. Um, but they've been more and more honest in, in the last couple months, especially Jim Irsay, who remember who made this decision. It wasn't Ryan Grigson. It wasn't anybody else who made the decision to cut Peyton Manning and draft this kid. And, and he only got seven years out of him and they didn't even make a Super Bowl. about how unprecedented this was in NFL history. Like the, like the when and the how and the why 15 days before season opener, your 29 year old franchise quarterback retires. He's done. It's over. And, and there's no, there's no short term fix. There's no coming back from that, that season. Um, and it's going to take a while. The crazy thing in all of this, the craziest thing maybe in all of this is Andrew Luck lives five minutes from the Colts facility. He could live anywhere in the world. He made $180 million in the NFL. He lives in Indianapolis where he retired early and he's almost become sort of like a ghost. Like I'll get messages from friends. I saw him at the airport. I saw him at the grocery like he doesn't do any public appearances. He's turned down God knows how many interview requests. Like, where is Andrew Luck is a common question that's asked in Indy. And the specter of him still hangs over this franchise. It just does. And it will until they find the next guy. You met him for coffee and talked for about 90 minutes. What what timing was that? And uh, he mentioned that he wanted it all kept off the record. How how was that conversation without giving away too much? It was great. Like, I'll be honest, man. Like, you know how you've done this for a long time. Like, you just, you meet some interesting people in this business. And that's one of the best parts. And he was, he was one of my favorite guys I've ever covered for a lot of reasons. He was fun as hell to watch. Like, just take your reporter half off, hat off. It's just fun to watch a quarterback who can do what he did. But then secondly, he, you know, he was never boring. He was interesting and he was insightful and he used words we never heard like perpetuity and modus operandi and in, in, in press conferences. And then he took umbrage with, with things. There you go. And, and then afterward, he'd be like, you know, I've been trying to use that word for a couple of weeks. I finally had a good. And I'm like, you are the weirdest mf -er I've he, been around. And, and he had a book podcast, a book club. <laughs> and he's yeah, you just. They don't make him like him. He's just weird. He read about cement. He told his teammates about it. He, the first time he ever walked into Lucas Oil Stadium, he looked around and said, can you guys appreciate the architecture of this place? And his teammates are like, shut up, man. Like, we got to line up, you know? And it's like, you love ca covering characters. And, and he, was, he was among the most unique. And it was interesting. Like, he almost asked me more questions than I asked him. It wasn't a reporter subject sort of interview. It was just chatting. Like, hey, do you remember this time? Like, 
who do you still keep in touch with? Oh, I, I, you know, I miss talking to that guy. And, um, but the sentiment that, you know, the question that everybody asked me is, no, he's not coming back. He's never coming back. I never thought he was. And, and, and the feeling I got that day was very obvious. Like he, he's moved on football's in the past and he's, he's okay with that. Like, I don't yeah. know if we are, I don't know if, you know, what we expect of these guys, but I think he's okay with that. I, I think that's why you get the question all the time. And, and I, I'll admit it pops into my head every once in a while about him because like, of, do you know how, how old he is right now? He's only he's 32, 32, right? Yeah. Like he could still play tomorrow if he wanted to. Yeah. Aaron Rodgers is going to be 39 this season. Like it's, it, it's, it's crazy. But so, but I, I think we all wish we could be that good at anything. And so we can't wrap our heads around just walking away from it. But I will say having met Andrew Luck, I, I deal with his dad for work quite a bit. You know, I'm not, I wasn't surprised that he was the one who did it that way because he struck me as someone who didn't need to be defined by football. That's well said. And that's a big part of six. Like why? Like how? Like, and that's the great duality with this guy. So, and you'll hear the players talk about this and, and his teammates and his coaches and scouts, like Andrew Luck loved football. Like he loved the game and he loved it for the right reasons. Like Matt Hasselbeck told me at one point, a lot of guys love being in the NFL. Now, not all of them love football. There's a difference. And Andrew loved football. He really did. He didn't care about. Yeah, He, he could be in the backyard or, or on the playground in England yeah. teaching his, his classmates how to play the game like that yeah. that part brought him the joy and he's he's yeah. spent some time with high school teams and he goes back to stanford every a while and and he really enjoys that like believe me like he really enjoys getting back on the field and no that doesn't mean he's coming back to play but he loved it for the right reasons but when it became what it became to him you know the kidney the the concussions the shoulder the ribs i'm losing track just name a body part and he wrecked right. it at some point um football became miserable and in the in the shame of all of it is and, and you've covered a lot of great players like Andrew Luck played with so much joy like he complimented the defenders who had just kicked his ass that was like he favorite. would slap the refs. my favorite thing about oh, yeah. him <laughs> like he he was so unique in that regard and he played with so much joy and so much fun and his teammates loved that and that was all stripped away from him and and when it was stripped away he just he told himself, there is more to life than football. This game has made me miserable, and and I can't have it be a part of my life anymore. And now he can study concrete as often as he wants. He's got all the time in the world. <laughs> it is it is truly amazing. I, I'm not sure what I would do if I had that big of a brain and that much time. Yeah, he needs like a challenge. And that's a big part of six is like, you know, David Shaw is really close to him. Tavita Pritchard, the the OC, the Andrew Luck director of offense. Yeah, I I, I love that when Tavita Pritchard right. goes, he beat me out for my job and now my name his name's on my business card. Right. He's like, I can't get away from the guy. Um, but he need, he needs a challenge. Like he can't just sit around and be idle. And, you know, I this is a small snippet. I don't think he'd mind me sharing. So he was asked to do this book reading in Indianapolis for six different authors. And I was like, oh, like, how are you going to prepare for that? And he's like, well, I'm going to read several books from every single author. And I'm like, not just one, not just a couple of them. Like, you're going to read 12 to 15 books just for this one afternoon, hour long speaking engagement. He's like, I can't do it any other way. One of a kind. One of a kind. I, I, I love it. That's it. I just I know he doesn't want to be in the public eye. But what I would love is is like once a year, maybe he contacts the guy who did the uh the Colonel Andrew Luck yeah. uh, Twitter feed. Yeah, how great and just was that one? Put out his five book recommendations for the year. Like I'd read everything he recommended. We talked about books, which shouldn't be a surprise. And and I and I tried to name a really unique book I'd read in the last year, and I thought I'd get him. And he goes, "Oh!" And he named the author right away. And he, <laughs> like, That's of incredible. course, Andrew. Uh, and I, to be honest, I, I I tried to get him for the podcast. He knew it was happening. Um, he thought about it. And he's obviously been very, very silent since he retired. He thought about it. He declined. Um, but I do have a feeling he'll, he'll listen to it at some point. Well, I, I hope he does. And, and again, please, Andrew, if you ever hear this, please take my recommendation. Just once a year, have, have that Twitter account. Drop a tweet with your five book recommendations, and, and I'll make them stocking stuffers for all my friends. So He could do that. Uh, I'm ready and he, that. Could, he could have 15 books. Pretty easy. 
<laughs> well, Zach, this, this has been a pleasure. Everyone, go to the Athletic Football Show feed and download all six episodes of Luck. It is fascinating listening. One of the more just intriguing characters that we've seen in college football, that we've seen in the NFL. Uh, we're all fascinated by the quarterback position in general, but this is one of the more interesting people who ever played it. Yeah, and it's why do this podcast, right? Why do it now? You know, some people in India are still hurt, but because it's so fascinating and it feels unfinished and it's incomplete and he's such a unique character and um, a lot of those memories and those thoughts came back to me as I reported this and then talked to so many people that were close to him. Well, it is a great listen, and uh, I got two more episodes to go. I will be done probably within a couple hours of us finishing recording this. So, <laughs> Six is a so heavy much, one, Zach. so good luck. Thank you, Zach. Thanks, man.